My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CATMUF, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CATMUF. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. And welcome to another edition of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. All right, so we are back after uh, what seems like a really long hiatus. I know we uh, we only left you guys uh, short one show, but uh, it's been a while since any of us have gotten together and done a show. And uh, this week we have a very special episode because, well, obviously this is Jeremy, you know who the hell I am, but I'm joined by Shane this week. And uh, when I say joined, I'm actually saying in person. What's up, brother man? What's up, man? It's great to be here. I know. We are at, we are still currently at the sixth annual Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest out in Dalton, Michigan. It's uh, the last full day here on Sunday. And we figured since uh, we need some episodes to give you guys because it's been a little while. Um... Since we're going to be in the same place, we might as well record together. And, you know, we, we could have tried to track down Dave and Andre. Well, really, track down Andre. I mean, Dave would have just probably ruined everything anyway. But, <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're out in the woods a little bit, and so, uh, Signal's not the greatest. So I figure we'll just do a live recording here, and uh, we're hopefully going to have a bunch of guests uh, because uh, there's still some people hanging out here. Uh, some of the uh, some of the bigger name speakers are even still around and may stop by for a chat. But uh, we figured we would do this and uh, get rolling and just uh, see who showed up. I mean, we have some people with us already. Uh, we got Shane Radliff from Liberty Under Attack and the Vanu Podcast is uh, hanging out with us. What's going on, man? Hey, not much. Uh, appreciate uh, you know being on the podcast uh, and good to be with you guys in person. It's uh, always nice to hang out. I know, man. This is great. I mean, obviously we've had you on the show before, but uh, it's so much better doing this. Li- like. I don't know. We the the only time I've ever really got to do this was the uh, the fiends episodes that we did at Pork Fest in 2016, where we were all together and we got to do those shows. And it's just, you know, I mean, it's fun to do, it's fun to do podcasts together, but to actually being able to sit in the same room together and see each other's like see the inflections and all that and whatnot, and you know, yeah, make make sure you get that thing fully packed. Anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we uh yeah, we're I don't know about you guys, but I've been having a hell of a time here. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. It's been great and yeah, another terrific year. Um it was awesome to meet uh Brett Brett Vinat finally. Uh so I've been listening to his podcast for, for quite some time and uh Scott Horton came in too and um yeah, I, I interviewed him a while ago and um yeah, when I moved down to Austin, I talked to him about it. Uh, we're going to get together and uh, record an interview. So, I mean, it's just been, uh, you know, great uh, making connections here as always. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, well, I, I, I haven't got a chance to interview Scott yet, but I, I was lucky enough that uh, one of the organizers here was, 
uh, uh, took took an interest in my cause because he knew I had one and interviewed Scott and actually uh, took all my information with him because he was the one who drove Scott back to the airport. And uh, actually, I when he returned today, he, he actually gave me the contact information. So it looks like uh, I have, whatchamacallit, now I have Scott's phone number. I'm pretty excited. There you go. Uh, I've been given permission to call Scott. So uh, we're going to set that up. I know he's a busy guy, but uh, it was I, I was excited because at first I was mad at Lou because Lou Fiend's here, of course. And Lou got the only actual interview with him because Scott was here for a very yeah, short amount of time. Lou got the exclusive. Yeah, but that's all right because I got to smoke a joint with Scott instead. So you know what? Screw you, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> I still win. <laughs> That's um, funny. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I've. I mean, you mentioned Brett Vanad. I got to meet him uh, a couple of years ago at Pork Fest, uh, but I've actually got to spend more time and speak with him because he got. He was here early, just like me. I mean, I've. I've been here since. You know, we went. You well, Radliff in here, and I have been here since Wednesday night. So uh, we've been hanging out for quite a while, and it's. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. But yeah, I got actually got to talk to Brett a bunch. We were actually supposed to do an episode of his podcast. He invited Shane and I onto on the School Sucks, which I was pretty stoked about. But unfortunately, we I think we're running short on time, and I think I may having car issues right now. So I don't know if we're going to get that done. I was hoping he was going to swing by here too, but we'll see. Um, what about you, Bueller, man? How, how how much fun are you having so far? Oh man, I'm having a lot of fun. Um, as you said, you know Scott Horton and Brett Van were here, uh, but I was really looking forward to meeting uh, Luis Fernando Mises, which I got to do. Um, I wanted to spend some more time with him and talk shamanism and entheogens and whatnot. Um, but it was great just to get to meet him and hang out with him around the fire. And uh, he gave a really great talk on uh, the inner journey uh, for freedom and taking personal responsibility. And, uh, you know, it's all about our perspective. Stay, stay on mic, brother. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, when we, uh, I like his, his perspective, how like, you know, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And that, uh, you know, transforming the outer world begins with our inner world. Yeah, I uh, well, I, I was psyched to meet Louis too, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to catch his whole talk because, well, Murder Dog was being kind of difficult, and uh, she did not want to sit still, so we had to leave halfway through. But yeah, it was great. It was great to finally meet him. I mean, we talked. You and I talked to him. Uh, what was it? A couple weeks before. I don't even remember now. We, we recorded it was so about many shows. two or three weeks before the fest that we actually had Luis on the show for a half hour or so at least. Yeah, yeah, and he was he was telling us what he was planning on talking about. So. Uh, so yeah, it was good. To, it was great to finally meet him because I mean I, I've known Luis for five years now, and uh, he was actually supposed to stop by and do the show with us, but unfortunately, well, he got busy and forgot. I guess we'll forgive him. We did just have him on recently. I guess we can get over it. But yeah, so I don't know, man. I've been I've been having a great time. I uh, I haven't followed up on my vlogs as much as I promised I would, but you know, life gets in the way. Parties happen. <laughs> <laughs> That they do certain uh, certain substances get passed around, and you know it's a, it's, a, it's a good time had by all. Well, mostly yeah. really all. I don't know. Has anybody else? Has anybody seen anybody who hasn't been having a good good time? Well, actually, that one lady who was really mad at us the first night at three a.m. and screaming at us about the <laughs> what did she say? The horrible electronic music. Uh, I mean, I wasn't going to necessarily she said shitty techno music at three a.m. Oh yeah, that was it. So I think it probably would have been okay if the techno music was just better. That's the way I interpreted it. <laughs> yeah. If we put on better music, right. maybe she'd be happy. I just I got a kick out of that because this is my first year staying down by the big bonfire, which is. Uh, you, where all the cool kids usually hang out because that's where, you know, the they party's usually gone all, all night long there. And it's, and it's always recommended. I think they, they say it on the site. They tell people when they when they express interest in, in the uh, event. And I think people are even reminded that when you get here that, hey, if you want to sleep, you may want to <laughs> set up camp a little bit further away from the bonfire. Right. Yeah, this is where everything happens. You know, Most and uh, you should just expect these things. I don't know. I mean, people expect us to be quiet at that hour of night. I have no idea. It just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, what else we got? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm losing focus already. This is going to be a great show. Well, I got to meet Derek Bros as well again. Yes, yeah. Um, he's been doing another tour this year, and he's going to be coming to my place in Cincinnati on Tuesday. We're going to be doing another action day where we're feeding the homeless, and then he's going to be giving his talk. Uh, this year's theme is uh, Liberate Your Mind. Uh, last year's theme was Decentralize Your Life. So uh, I like the kind of way that um, these themes are getting more about uh, the individual and their, you know, responsibility for their own actions and, the, you know, the self-growth and self-realization that's involved with all that. And, uh, yeah, so I really like how anarchists are taking a more spiritual and psychological approach rather than just... And more individualistic, too. One. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, rather I agree. than, yeah, these... 
collect movement is sort of things. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I noticed that that trend too. I actually put it in my notes of something I wanted to mention that, yeah, there was a, it seemed like there's kind of a, a pretty big shift towards, you know, being free now and not uh, so much about, Absolutely. you know, down the road in a hypothetical future, I guess. Yeah, I've I've had multiple conversations uh, this this weekend already with people about that very subject, and it's uh, I'm I too I'm 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 stoked to see it. I mean, obviously, uh, Radliff over here and I both kind of kind of kind of doing the quad. Well, I think we're both kind of a quasi vine nomadism at this point. I mean, you don't even, you don't even have a you don't even have a truck, man. You're living out of a car. Um, but uh, you know, people like us are trying to get uh, freer right now. But we're running into more and more people who. Uh, do the same and I think one of our potential guests is having an issue with his dog is Sammy being nasty again uh, <laughs> she's losing her mind over there oh yes oh yes I right, now see now see, now you now you interjected it I forget what I'm supposed to call you now what's your new name sir we, we do have our what, what, another T-Samof yes this is a a friend of ours we met another van nomad which was actually kind of cool we uh, Shane and I kind of rolled in here together um, with a, yet another van nomad <laughs> and uh, there's there's four of us here now which is kind of crazy because you know, this is something that uh, Shane's obviously been talking about on the uh, on the Vinyl podcast for for a while now. Um, but more and more more and more people are popping up, and that's part of that whole you know individual freedom, getting your freedom now, taking absolute responsibility for yourself and stuff. And uh, you've you've been doing you've been doing I mean you've been doing this for a little while now, but you actually are set, trying to set yourself up with a bigger vehicle because you're in a minivan right now, which still has more space than my vehicle, but. Yeah, the minivan's getting pretty small between me and my big dog. She's about 80 pounds, 90 pounds or so. And uh, we're currently building out a, a Dodge 1990, what is it, or 1987 uh, 228 Explorer. It's a huge vehicle. It's about 21 feet long or so. It's got a bed in the back. It's got, uh, it's got a kitchenette, a dinette, and a bathroom and some storage area for your clothing and stuff like that, which I carry very little of anyway. And uh, I, I mean, I know we've talked about this privately, but let's get you, let's get it on let's get it on the record. Uh, what uh, what what kind of drove you to this lifestyle? You know, what uh, what it, <laughs> drove me to this lifestyle? Yeah, the, the constant bombing of brown people, beating up on its citizens, all that garbage that goes on out there, the the way that they abuse people, tax people without permission, the political crusading, all that stuff. I just can't stand to live with it anymore. So you just have to just try to get as far away from it as possible? Absolutely. Oh, I can dig that, man. Yeah, and you're into Vani too, aren't you? Absolutely. I, I, I love that strategy of freedom. It just kind of lets you do almost anything you can just to get out of giving the state a little bit more money and living a little bit more freer, living in the second realm. Uh, staying, I'm, or, uh, Shane, I'm pretty sure you've gone into us plenty of times on this podcast. And you get to meet up with other uh, people and just trade amongst yourself without allowing the state between you. I love that. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan too. And uh, I mean, even though as as we've discussed, um, well, I think I've discussed on my own shows more, but uh, I, I know I know that I talked about it on the seeds too. That like I'm I'm doing this as kind of a quasi experiment, and uh, just as a way to save money in the interim. Although technically, that's what you're planning on doing too, Shane. Right? Your yours your 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 plan is a little longer drawn out than mine, but you're you're doing the same thing. This is just kind of a stopgap measure for you, right? Yeah, yeah. The the van nomadism thing. It it's, it looks like an incredible lifestyle. Um, so yeah, I'm working towards that, but what I really want to do is uh, pursue minimal sailboating, but I don't know how to sail a boat and I don't have the money to buy a boat. So it's <laughs> pretty expensive and, uh, you know, van nomadism could, uh, you know, be that, uh, that's interim lifestyle to get me there. So that's, that's the, that's the goal at least. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, like I said, on a shorter term, that's exactly the goal for me save as much money. Cause as I mean, we've talked about, I think we talked about the last time we had you on the show about the fact that so you know so people are more and more people are doing this and they're figuring out that they can live on as little as 500 to 750 dollars a month and there's so many options to pick up part-time work or, or as you you like to talk about like the different seasonal work and stuff like right. that and temp jobs and you can just bounce all you know if you have the ability to travel which i unfortunately do not at the moment you know as we've discussed i'm still trapped on long island i mean i get to be in michigan right now which is great but uh, i'm gonna have to return to that hellhole soon <laughs> um so i don't get to travel that much that often um which you know I, I prefer to but other people that can you could just bounce from town to town and uh you set up jobs ahead of time and uh you know stop in like even if it's not a town you're planning on staying and you as if you're passing through you can end up uh 
what you call it you you can just you know on on your way through to another town stop off at one town hang out for half a day pick up uh you know pick up a bunch of money and just move on on you right. know you yeah, know postmates and such yeah yeah well yeah you you and i've discussed that i that's right. something i i had totally forgotten about and i definitely now that i finally have clean it's a paperwork, nomad job yeah yeah now, now that i finally have clean paperwork again i i finally cleared up that nasty issue with the multiple suspensions i didn't know i had on my license um i can actually get one of those jobs which ironically that's how i found out that I, my license was suspended was when i I applied for uh, one of the, when I tried to sign up for one of those jobs originally. They're like, "Oh, we can't hire you because you have a suspended license." I'm like, "Oh, that's nice. I was not aware of this." <laughs> um, but yeah, that's stuff like that or Uber Eats. And for the life of me, I still can't. I, I want to oh. say Insta Shopper, but I don't think that's right. But there was two specific ones that I tried to use. Speaking of income, there's also like passive types of income that you can try right. to get going. Also, in the meantime, they will kind of support you even while you're sleeping. Yeah, as a yeah, as a path toward financial independence. Yeah, as a, as a preparatory measure. That's what I'm doing with a lot of my work now is setting up, you know, getting passive income streams started, so that when I'm on the road, I don't have to make as much, so I'll be able to work less. Absolutely, so that's the idea. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I of course have still not set everything up. I'm I'm starting to figure out ways to make a little bit here and there. But as I've talked about, you know, I I have the safety net that I can use and I actually plan to use anyway. So if I figure things out a lot quicker, then I can end up saving even more of that money, which would be great. But I'm not. I don't think it'll kill me if I do end up spending that money. But overall, sure, you can, uh, you know, you definitely, uh, any passive income stream. I mean, I, I lost my one passive income stream, unfortunately. I had to turn my miner off. That was such a wonderful passive income stream, uh, my crypto miner, you know. But uh, I think, Shane, Shane you talk, you've discussed about possibly trying to figure out a way to run one off a solar panel, right? Like we're on a small miner, possibly. I've thought about it, yeah. But, I mean, I would have to buy, I would have to really seriously expand my solar setup and, like, devote a couple of solar panels to that alone. And um, it's just not not that feasible right now, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it's something I seriously thought about, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Jamin Baconic, who's uh, actually here, too, he talked about, uh, you know, having a miner in there and then just only hooking up to, you know, like, when you have a, sol a solid line to, like, is at an RV park or something. Um, which, but then you have to stay at an RV park for, like, two weeks to make, you know, to make money or, or however long it would take, so. Yeah, that's, because that's the unfortunate thing. E even if you find a, a particular coin that you think has potential and uh, is still, like, really easy to mine where you get, like, a, a huge number of them a day, you it, pretty much every pool you use, you have to like it has to be running for a lot. Of, most of them are like usually at least an hour before you even get a pay, start getting payouts. So you have to make sure that you that they can run at least that long. And exactly, you know, you have to get as least uh, you know at least usually a couple of days at the mo at the least at the absolute least uh, of consistent connection. So you actually make it worth your while. Otherwise, yeah, it's not really yeah, worth it. It. Re it reduces your freedom. It makes you become more dependent upon like you know the RV you know RV parks. If you do if if I were to decide to you know pursue that route, so I probably I won't do it. Um, I, I'll what I'll probably do is. Um, just you know, probably get get my brother, you know, the necessary equipment, have him set it up for me, and then I'll just give him like ten percent of whatever I uh, mine, and he can manage it, um, you know, from a from a stationary location. So that's yeah. what I plan on doing instead. Yeah. A lot more cost efficient, I think. Oh, absolutely. That's like that's actually a really good idea, and and something I had actually toyed with originally. It was only because I built my miner myself, and I really wanted to try to figure everything out on my own. But I had actually gotten an offer from uh, I think it was actually a fiend fan <laughs> to uh, take my miner from me and set the whole thing up. And obviously, I would get pay the money for electricity and, and a little money for rent or whatever. But they would run it out in Idaho, which I believe is currently where the cheapest electricity is in the country. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so yeah, if you if you happen to know anybody, you know. For any for any potential van nomads or people who are doing this already out there, if you happen to know anybody in Idaho, that is the place to go if you want to do crypto mining. So yeah, t tell them to hook a brother up and uh, set your mine up. I luckily actually did it. I did get an offer for somebody else to set uh, my miner up too, uh, although it's not with me and it's going to be a pain in the butt to get it. I don't know. I'll figure it out. But yeah, it's, it's still possible. Um, you know, and, I'll, and you know, thinking about the whole making money or even helping support yourself even further on the road uh we were having this discussion the other night i don't know i remember saying oh shane should be here for this and then i think you walked away and i don't know if we talked about it when he came back but something had popped in my mind about you know possibly trying to figure out some way to you know especially if you're going to be on the go a lot you know figure out a figure out a way to actually grow things 
with you, like microgreens, mm -hmm. for instance, because you know there's a lot, there's a lot of different you know different varieties of the microgreens. After talking to Drew Sample, who was actually here from the Sample Hour, and by, that was actually a, a, a quick side note. Drew Sample is an amazing human being, and hanging out with him was such a blast. Uh, I cannot wait till I finally move closer out here to where he is in Columbus, so I can actually hang out with him more because we had so much fun. Uh, but after talking to him and stuff, because that's what that's his big deal right now. That's what he's doing with the microgreens. Is that you know some of these crops literally you could turn over them turn them over in a week yeah um you know mm -hmm. and the other ones you know two or three weeks is kind of a uh, kind of a standard so you wouldn't really need to rely on like great weather for that long and like may maybe you could figure out some way again maybe there's i'm thinking maybe there's a possible way even if, if you're somebody who has a bigger setup like you know it's actually putting in solar panels for other reasons even if you have to run a grow light sometimes yeah you know like I don't know. What do you think about that? I don't know. I think it might be a possibility because it doesn't take up a lot of space either. Even just do little stuff. Even if it's just to, for to supplement your own food, or if you want to, if you have a big enough space, if you want to trigger figure out a way to make a little extra money as you're driving around. Right. Yeah. Well, I think. Um, I mean, if if anyone buys a vehicle, they can, can they can convert it into, or they can, I guess. Um do whatever they want with it. They can build it out however they want to. So if they want to have a microgreen section, I don't see why they why they shouldn't. Um, I don't. I just don't know how how much room they would take up. Um, that would be my main concern. Right now, I've seen setups in apartments where like really small window sills have been used to grow wheatgrass, and a wheatgrass grows really quickly. And uh, when it's young in the first couple of weeks, it's actually very sweet and very nutritious, and uh, that can have a really fast turnover as well. And it can take a very small space. You might even be able to micro uh, scale it down even. Smaller smaller micro and, micro greens yeah <laughs> you could probably instead of like the big uh trays that they use in like a windowsill for an apartment you could probably use like ice cube trays and put little seedlings in there and then you can like turn that over really quickly after you harvest it and juice it yeah and stuff mm -hmm. like stuff like wheatgrass still in like certain markets still goes for a decent amount of money so yeah you could probably make a you could probably make a bunch yeah, and I guess for just uh, additional food, um, I, there are. I know some van nomads who actually sprout stuff on the road. Um, well, that yeah, take up much space. And well, we've yeah. we, we've discussed that with one of our van nomads and friends that is here right now. That uh, about uh, that idea. Yeah. Well, uh, earlier when you said we had four van nomads here, yeah, uh, Ken, I think indicated that we actually have a fifth. Oh, no, oh, I was talking about Chris. Yeah. I think it's, just, it's it's the three of us here and Chris. <laughs> I think we're the four official ones. Oh yeah, I'm not actually a van nomad. No, I'm just no. very interested in it. Yes, <laughs> so it's a very interesting lifestyle. And you know, as I've discussed before, I'm having a, I'm I, I I I've had my struggles, but I I you know I knew that was coming to begin with. Man, everybody keeps tripping over my tent. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we get for inviting people down to the cave the cave over the cave of chewiness over here. That's, yeah, that's, that's a whole other <laughs> story. Cove maybe in the woods. <laughs> maybe we'll dumped. have to get that into it into that on a Patreon episode. Episode. Yeah, um, but yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I just I had that idea. I, it was just it popped into my head the other night when we were talking about something else, and uh, I was trying to I was trying to flesh it out a little bit more and thinking, eh, you know, maybe. I mean, heck, even if you have a big enough van, you might be able to set up some kind of tray system on the roof, you know, well, next I to the solar panels. If you have like big enough side windows or something, like in in this like second row seating or whatever that you don't need to like be able to see out of when you're driving, you could put little shelves or trays or something in there. Uh, and the sprouts only don't have to grow very tall before you can harvest them and juice them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's interesting. You know, like I said, I, I, I would just spitball on ideas because I haven't quite figured out how. Because again, I don't know how long I'm going to be doing this, so I didn't really, I didn't really take enough precaution to figure out income streams and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna have to wing it along the way, which is fine. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's an interesting idea. But yeah, the definitely the the you know just random growing along the way and. Uh, or if you can find a way to set up a uh, like a hidden garden. Oh yeah, or, 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 or crypto culture. It's what Rayo talked about, where you could uh, actually have, you know, um, you could actually plant stuff like probably out in the Siski region. Uh, if you just grow in small patches, um, no one will really ever know, and you can go harvest it whenever you need to. And I'm pretty sure that's where Rayo grew his marijuana, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that would be a good place to grow it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you could do that. Or I've, I've heard tell some people have actually tried to grow gardens in public parks. <laughs> yep. um, yeah. If you can get away with it, why not? I mean, I, I'm all for the whole gorilla gardening thing, wh whether it be cannabis or food. Um, I, I highly encourage that stuff. I used to do, I used to do it myself. Um, even before I was an anarchist, I did it when I, uh, after I got mad when I first bought my house. And I realized that the strip of property in between the sidewalk and the street didn't actually belong to me, even though I was the one, like if I didn't mow it, I would get like fined and stuff like that. So like you're required to maintain it, but it actually belongs to the town. 
um, you know, anything past the sidewalk or that 15 foot radius, you know, whatever it is. So that annoyed me so much because they would come to my house and they ripped the they ripped the front of it up like three times in the first two years that I lived there to replace the first to fix one of the lights that used to be there. The, or no, yeah, and then the second time to fix it, and the third time they decided to move, to replace it all together and then move the light down to my neighbor's house. So they ripped up the front of the house like three times and did like the most horrible job of planting. Se- you know, they they just throw like a handful of seeds back down. They're like, "Good luck, buddy." <laughs> and uh, I got so frustrated after that that I just started carrying seeds with me and dumping them, um, and usually in the more affluent neighborhoods, <laughs> just just throwing them and stuff. And uh, you know, coming coming back a couple weeks later, a couple months later, and see what actually sprouted up. I would have loved to have been there for the reaction from people when they like walk out and listen. There's like a bunch of pumpkins and uh, <laughs> acorn squashes and shit because that's apparently some of the stuff that grows the best up by where I am. Or at least that's what I had the best success with. But yeah, just throw it all over the place. Um, yeah, because remember in uh, Ben Stone's book, uh, Surgeon's Diversion and Sabotage, when he talked about uh, you know just uh, spreading marijuana seeds and you know just all over the place and just you know, growing it everywhere so that uh, there's no way they can regulate it because it just it just you know grows. Because it becomes ubiquitous yeah. at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember when I first read that, I, I asked them if he had known about the, uh, there was a march like that. I can't, I, I want to say it was about five, but my timeline has been so skewed over the, like, uh, my old, my old man in this is, is catching up with me. And uh, I can't really remember, but there was definitely a walks at March, somewhere between five and eight years ago, where a whole bunch of people, I think it might have started it up in Vermont. But they wherever like it was somewhere up in the New England area. I'm pretty sure it was north of New York. But they all marched down like they took their time, so it took a few days or whatever, um, all the way down to D.C. And the entire time they were guerrilla gardening with cannabis, and they were just throwing it along the highways or the side roads or where, or the woods wherever they were walking. Every just like every I think they had it. The, the, you know, they, it, everybody was supposed to do it like every 20 feet. You know, whatever. Um, just dump a few of them here, dump a few of them there. And uh, I'm pretty sure I remember Ben saying he hadn't heard about that. But I'm like, yeah, I love that stuff, man. That's great. Just exactly throw it everywhere. And uh, yep, any way we can make the state irrelevant. Yeah. Well, yeah, because that's you know one that as I always say, the easiest way to, to uh, combat any law is to make it unenforceable. Yep. And the way you do that in almost any situation is just get enough people to say, nah, I don't, I don't give a shit about that law anymore. And because the uh, the bludgies, uh, as the term that I like to use, that Shane brought to us from the from the Vanu <laughs> podcast. Thank you, Vanuans. Yes, thank you, Vanuans. <laughs> the uh, the bludgies uh, are want to uh, you know harass you anyway. I I'd ra- you know I just like I, I just like finding ways to fuck with them. Because <laughs> uh, what else are you gonna do? Um, and they're they're gonna they're gonna keep arresting people. So, uh, but they're they are also severely outnumbered. So if enough people just say no, you know. I, I often point to I those. Just, I just wish they didn't start enforcing Title IV flag code. That would be so fucking hilarious. It would be bad because a lot of people would be getting tossed in cages. But um, where it's uh, you know like violate yeah so like violating the flag code. Mm, yeah. yeah, thirty days in jail and or a hundred dollar fine. Like, what if they just started tossing people in cages for you know wearing like an American flag shirt or something? Like thirty <laughs> days, get the fuck in there. Yeah. Like that would like that would be incredible, but they won't do that because why would they you know enforce patriotism or or I guess not to, or disenforce whatever that would be you know what I'm talking well, about. Well, g- give old, go, g- give old Donnykins enough time, and I think he might try to be enforced in patriotism. He seems to be well, or, yeah. or hardcore nationalism rather. <laughs> I mean, they'd be disincentivizing patriotism. That's a better way to put it. Yeah, they started arresting people for it. No, yeah, they well, need they need that shit to survive. Well, of course. So and they and they rely on the uh, they rely on the revenue more that they can bust people for the bullshit. So, but uh, I wasn't gonna say the uh, yeah. But so as far as them being outnumbered, like it really doesn't take much. I mean, I often point to there was a uh, multiple events I remember again over the past like same five to eight year timeline where there was like somebody getting somebody getting harassed by the cops. Uh, I believe one of them was in Philly and another one in Florida that I read about. I can't remember the, what city it was in Florida. But somebody was about to be arrested, and just a whole group of people were like, yeah, no, this is bullshit. And they surrounded the individual and basically formed a human shield. And the cops had no choice but to back down because they're not, you know, they're, they're even in that immediate situation, they've now been outnumbered like two, you know, like 30 to two. <laughs> and yeah. even if they call for backup, it's, all it's going to do is get uglier and uglier. And that's one of those PR things that the police, despite their, their seemingly uh, uh, lack of concern for the wanton killing and, and, and raping and pillaging that a lot of them do, uh, there's certain PR things that they try not to get involved in directly like that. Um, so, uh, the police always back off and I wish more people would do that, you know? 
um, because that just the, the show of force like that is uh, is, is usually all it takes because they, they they are they're, they're I think the last time I ran the numbers was last year for some meme I made and I think it was still saying there's only like officially 101 police you know law enforcement officers in the a million or one rather in the uh, in the country and you know if you add in all the other stuff I think it still works out to like close to somewhere between 250 to 301 yeah 300 to one rather uh, as far as like overall enforcement class versus the population yeah that kind of reminds me of a Konkin quote where he addressed that uh, he said uh, confrontation with the state's enforcers must await the market's generation of uh, protection agency syndicates yeah. of sufficient strength uh, all else is premature and I think that's where he was kind of like showing where that pragmatic line in the sand kind of is is where we really can't we have to pick and choose our battles to the point where we don't fight the ones that we can't win yet you know yeah and so when it gets to that point you know then maybe the the tide will turn and the government will be outnumbered and and will have you know more force you know to back it up with not the initiation of force but self defense yeah self defense yeah it reminds me of the uh, the Mallory wildlife refuge or the uh, refuge occupation up in uh, Oregon where um you know they these these protesters were there for like um I don't remember exactly how long it was it was weeks you know weeks we're we're talking weeks and um you know, like the they had the place surrounded the entire time, and uh, the the bludgies did, uh, and they just you know waited them out, and they didn't go in like they did at Waco or Ruby Ridge or anything like that. They just you know well they they have to come out sometime. Uh, you know they're they're going to give up and and at some point. So um, you know I guess that might be uh, I guess uh, better. You know that uh, people aren't uh, you know dying, but uh, yeah, still a lot of lots of people going to prison. <laughs> Or uh, civil disobedience, or even civil defiance. Yeah. Well, now, I, I, I mean, do you, as far as that particular situation goes, do you think it was more? I, I don't know if it was more like you know, I, you would like to think that they that the yeah, government, as horrible as it is, learned its lesson after Ruby Ridge and Waco and stuff like that, um, and that's why they decided not to just charge in on these people. But I, you know, it probably has something a lot more to do with the fact of what happened a couple of years earlier at the Bundy Ranch when there was an actual enough, standoff yeah. yeah, and thousands of people were there. My dad included my dad. My dad was one of the oath keepers who was there with his yeah, rifle okay. um, aimed at aimed at federal, federal and local and state, 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 federal you know, officials, um, you know. Kind of proud of that moment, um, yeah, <laughs> despite yeah. what I think about the Oath Keepers and stuff like that. Now I, you know, still pretty cool. I'm like, you know what, the Oath Breakers, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, but they, uh, you know, was, I, I think it might have had something to do with that. The fact is, like, yeah, last time we went up against these guys, didn't go so we we look like complete assholes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean, if if you look at the the outcome of that, and um, you know, the the state really screwed themselves over. Um, you know, they they had probably you know forty plus you know solid felony convictions you know on the table, but they only really got like a handful you know, sent to prison. Most of them just got let go or or you know whatever whatever uh, something along those lines. So they got fucked in this entire deal, and it's going to get worse. Wow. Like if, if they if if they start doing this shit, like they the, the federal government lost. I, I think I think I think Lavoy Finicum got a little bit worse. Well, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's true, but. Yeah. Yeah. But overall, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. It's yeah. They're they're not gonna. They they got embarrassed and they can't let something like this go unanswered. So I I'm kind of worried for the next stupid stunt these patriots try to pull off because um you know good intentions and all obviously but I'm um, kind of uh, you know worried that it's gonna be worse this time. Well, yeah. I mean, again, I mean, history dictates that it usually will get worse. And uh, but, but again, only. I mean, we're only talking. Well, when was uh, Ruby Ridge? Middle nineties, ninety four, ninety five, somewhere in there. Something like that. Um, so you know, and uh, so we're talking. We're not. We're you know, we're not talking that that long ago. And uh, they were pretty violent then, but they've actually backtracked. Although that also that that actually kind of falls in line with the with how the rest of uh, I, I've I've said for the longest time I believe the uh, USSA government actually operates where they've been they've been around long enough and been able to see so many other attempted empires try to launch up and stuff like that and watch how they failed by trying to rush to power right that uh, as as inept as a lot of them are and I I don't think all of it I don't think all of the bad things are. are direct uh, you know directly a cause of some kind of uh, malicious intent um but there are there's definitely some of them and i i think i think they uh, i think uh, d despite how much i despise them i i have to credit at least a little bit and th say that I, I believe that this particular government has actually uh 
learned its lessons well from others and has done has done the uh you know the frog in the boiling pot scenario here better than pretty much anybody else ever has because they've drawn out this uh you know from 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 the days when if you look back in the history where you know the some of the people that are considered some of the greatest leaders like fdr um were openly all about the fascism you know and it's like it's it kept coming and it kept coming but they disguised it so well that most people are like oh what are you talking about so now when it comes back around again and you know with the now with the all right and the, the, the term nazis and fascists and all this stuff getting thrown around again people are clueless to the fact it's like no you don't realize like as uh what is it uh was it is robert higgs uh refers to it as a soft fascism the uh what, what we've been living under in, in the united states for however yeah. long and it's you know if you if you look at the actual definition of fascism and you look at um especially the uh the you know mussolini model which is c considered i guess what you know the original one or at least the standard that most people go by it, it fits in really well you know? <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is tough to classify it as you know just fascism or just no it's not just I mean, but it's because I, I mean like there's there's plenty of communism I'm, i mean i i did an episode on this like right at the beginning of liberty under attack but going through the 10 plank the uh, 10 planks of the communist manifesto and i mean there were probably six or seven that are already in place so like there's so much communism and so much fascism all just rolled into this really statist you know uh, bullshit bundle i guess <laughs> Yeah, it's it's definitely. I, I used to call it quasi-fascist, you know, because I knew that, you know, I know there's other elements, but right. We're uh, we're dragging ourselves down a dark path here. What are we doing, man? We're here at the fest. We should be talking about fun <laughs> things. So uh, I don't even remember how we got down this path, but I don't uh, either. Yeah, well, this this happens when we get together. Um, so anyway, what else? Uh, well, what about? God damn it! Now I forget. Now I forget your new name again. I'm, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna, this is gonna take a T while for me. Some move. Okay, I'm just gonna T call you T. Okay, right, that's gonna make T. it easy. All right, T. Mr. T. I'm a Mr. T. Mr. T. Okay, no. Gold earring. Mr. T. That's gonna trigger me. I don't know if I. I, I think I've told this on one show, but I can't remember which one it was. But I, I used to have this reoccurring dream when I was a child, and it was the weirdest freaking thing. And I'm, I can only assume it's because I was obsessed with the AT, A team around that age. But, you know, lots of people have falling dreams, you know, stuff like that. It's supposed to signify something or other, whatever. And as long as you don't, you know, I, I remember always being told, as long as you don't die in your dream, you'll be okay. So as a kid, I'm like, okay, God, Jesus Christ, I, you know, because I started having these dreams where I would just be falling. I don't know why I was up in the air so high to begin with, but I would be falling or like I would go on a swing and, you know, try to you know swing as high as I can. And then when I launched off, I would just keep going and going and going. Anyway, every time I fell, just before I was about to splat into the ground, Mr. T would appear out of nowhere and catch me. That's what I do, foo. <laughs> I still, I still haven't got an interpretation of that that I really like. So uh, I don't know what that. I still don't know really what it means. But anyway, you mentioned Mr. T, so I, I just thought I'd go there. So anyway, T, how have uh, how have you been enjoying your time here at the fest? Dude, this is the greatest place on earth, man. Everything's been happening around here. You know, free trade everywhere. You know, there's no state in sight. We get to do whatever we want, trade whatever currency we want. It is awesome. I'm in love with this place. I, I, I want to do this every week. <laughs> this is the, the this, I, You're this trying is your to live that second realm lifestyle consistently. This is your yeah. first time here? This is my very first yes. time here. Well, I, I totally understand that sentiment because I was pretty much the same way after I came three years ago for the first time. I'm like, can, we, can I come back next week? <laughs> you know, like, can we make this a weekend thing? This would be great. And, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about setting up Taz Fests everywhere, uh, temporary uh, autonomous zones everywhere, mm -hmm. all over the cities everywhere, so we could just meet up whenever we feel like and deal however we want to deal and, you know, do what we want to do. Yeah. Hey, you and I talked about that a little earlier. I, th I think that's a great idea. And I think, because, uh, I mean, we've, we've talked about it on this show a bunch. D uh, Dave, who's who's not here, thankfully, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we've talked about for the longest time setting up setting up the Seeds Fest. And, you know, we kind of had, we, we wanted to do it. We, we were looking for private property to do it on because that's even, you know, that's even better. I mean, we could definitely try to pull these things off on uh, so-called public land where, uh, you know, the different national forests and stuff where you're allowed to camp, um, which I think is a great idea. And that's... Uh, you could do it. That's what they do at the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous. They just find some spot in the in the desert. Yeah, yeah exactly. Or, or uh, what should we call it? You know, uh, Jackalope Festival. The Jackalope Festival, right. they, they do the same thing. So you could definitely do it there. If you can find private land, even better. But yeah, I mean, I we had talked about doing that originally because we wanted to get a more centralized location 
for people to go to because we were actually looking somewhere. I think we figured it out like Kansas would probably be the most centralized for the most people we know. But I mean, Kansas there's, sucks. There's up. nothing. There's nothing <laughs> in Kansas. I mean, Tom, Tom Woods talks about it all the time. It was the worst experience of his life living living in Kansas for all those years. Um, <laughs> it was just miserable. But uh, so we were gonna go. I think we were gonna try to find some place in Tennessee. We actually had somebody who we finally got hooked up with who had a uh, who had a bunch of land there that was gonna uh, let us use it. Uh, fell through. We never actually worked it out, but uh, you know, I wanted to do it so there, so more people could come together. Because I mean, being here at the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest is awesome. And I mean, obviously, I've talked about this before. I drive for the third year in a row. I've driven eleven and a half, twelve hours to get here, versus driving the five and a half hours it would take me to get to Pork Fest, which now for the past two years has occurred at the same time. And I opt to drive all the way out here because I love the I love the setting here more. Uh, I love the people here more. Um, I mean, okay, I shouldn't say that. I know there's a lot of people at Pork Fest who I'm missing. Sorry, guys. I don't, I don't love you any less, really, kind of, maybe. Um, but uh, no, I just, I, I just, I like the environment and the, and the energy here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's slowly gotten bigger every year, but it's still not, you know, it's still not huge, which is, which is great because I prefer it's an the advantage. Yeah. Yeah. The right more, now. the more intimate nature, you actually get to have conversations with more people. You know, I went to, I went to Pork Fest once and yeah, I got to meet a lot of people for the first time, but we, it was like high and by type of stuff. Like you, you had time to sit down because there's so many people and it's so spread out that like by the time you actually do things, it's like, maybe you can have a conversation or two. And, uh, you know, this is just so much ch- more chill and relaxed. But you have this year. You have Pork Fest up in New Hampshire. You have uh, a Go- where's a Gora Fest up in Minnesota, Anarchon down in uh, Virginia, mm-hmm. right? It was in Virginia, Shane. Yep. Yeah, yep. it is. Gore, Virginia. Yep. Yeah, uh, and there's a couple other ones, Jackalope out in Arizona, and a couple other ones and stuff like that. But it's a lot. It's really hard for people to get a lot of people to get to these things. Like I'd love to go to Jackalope, but Arizona's a fucking hike, you know. So that's um, that's a journey. Exactly. So we originally wanted to set up Seeds Fest in a more like more centralized. So hopefully more people could come together who haven't been able to meet each other because they go to all these other fests. But all along the way, I kept saying, if more people want to do this, like I think the more the merrier. And whether it's like a full, like a you know five or six day event or whatever, where you actually have speaker, you know, people who come in and speak and give presentations, um, and have uh, dance parties, like apparently we had last night. I don't know. I've missed that. I missed that for the third year in a row. So I, I don't actually know. <laughs> I, was, what goes. I was there for like five minutes at the beginning, and then I, I left. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't actually know what goes on in the anarchist at the anarchy ball. But um, but whether you do that or whether it's just a weekend of camping, like I think uh, I think you're talking. You're, that's what you're talking about, T, right? More like just camp. I mean, do obviously doing like a, the agora type stuff where people are allowed to hawk their wear. You know, can hawk their wares freely for yeah. whatever. But uh, you're not talking about you know doing inviting speakers and stuff like that. And have, no, have a, I, exactly. I'm talking about several uh, you know schedules that people can put up. You know, it doesn't matter if they conflict or not. People are in charge of getting their own uh, crowd in front of them as they speak and all that kind of stuff. And more uh, spontane- yeah, more spontaneous. I like the organic type of meetings. Like I was really turned on by Fork Fest and. Um, now, what, what is what is Forco and okay, stuff can, like can, that? Can you explain those two a little bit for uh, our listeners who may not? Because I actually hadn't heard. I I'd heard of a narco folk, Forco, but I had never even heard of the uh, uh, Porco Forco until you or whatever it is. The, yeah, Forkfest. So, you told me about it. so uh, Pork, Forkfest was Shirefest, uh, formerly known as Somalia Fest, and all that stuff. Oh, and, wait a minute. We started yeah. Somalia Fest. Yeah. The fiends started that back <laughs> in 2016. That's yeah. what it morphed into already. I had no idea. Yeah. So now it's known as Forkfest. So oh. like a bunch of people go out there and camp without having to pay a central organization oh, for the so that's gift where you of went? getting into you, the you, stupid you, centralized uh, pork fest. Uh, fest. Pork fest. Sorry, so you I went love to that pork festers, year. but like, man, well, no, the, like I said, the we should be doing good. this for free. We shouldn't be well, paying a centralized organization to get all this set up. I like speakers and all, and if that's your thing, go ahead and do it, but that's not my thing at all. Well, yeah, was, but you were at this this anarcho. Uh, thing. I keep saying I want to say anarcho folk. I was at fork, both. Fork, fork fest. You were at fork fest. I was at fork um, fest. Was, was, was James Babb at that one? Uh, he usually he's, he's I, I thought he was the one who took up the mantle, mantle for us. Probably, I, uh, I wouldn't doubt it. But be honest, if with you, you were, uh, I was gonna say if you were there, you'd probably know Babby because yeah, I was everybody having knows fun who in my is. own ways on my own time. If you know what I mean. Oh, uh, I see how it is. I see how it is. But well, that's what that's all about, right? You're supposed to do your own thing there. Exactly. So. Yeah, it's it's totally just organic. You just meet up with somebody he's like hey you want to do this thing and it's like yeah let's do this thing and then suddenly it happens it's great 
Yeah, I, like I said, I, I love that too. And you know, to me, it doesn't matter because I, I I enjoy this event because there's a, kind of a mix of both. We're kind of just hanging out, right. and there's there's the opportunity to have speakers and stuff. And it's a little, you know, it's organized. There is a there's technically an organization that puts this on, or at least used to. I don't know. That was, that was like a sub organization that's putting it on because it's not collect. It's not, isn't it not con- connected to the original organization? Well, no, I guess the original organization was you know Katie Testa and uh, Danny Damon. And uh, they got had a little get together the first year, you know, and then I yeah. guess the you know the Midwest, uh, Michigan Peace and Liberty Coalition kind of grew out of that, and uh, they had more volunteers than they could use last year, and so they, uh, they you know, all the past committee members voted on next year's or this year's committee members. Yeah, but I'm not talking about that. I, I thought I, I thought I heard tell that the uh, the co- coalition wasn't actually associated with the fest this year. That's why the signs had to be changed. Oh, well, I don't know. I guess there was a little bit of a fork. Yeah, speaking (laughs) of forks. This was a contentious hard fork. (laughs) (laughs) Luckily, luckily, uh, not not enough people decided to take that fork. Uh, There's very few people that I guess... yeah. Well, well, the, well, there's there's some noticeable absences from. Uh, there are noticeable absences, and uh, you know, I, I'm not one to burn bridges, but you know, you know, I believe in the freedom of association. You know, and people are free to associate or not associate with those that they choose on an individual basis, not collective. Yeah. You know, so we don't want to become pork fest like with Ian Freeman or anything. Oh yeah, that was that was horrible. I, right. actually, I actually, that the year that I went was the year that they did that to Ian and. We actually contemplated not going because of it in solidarity, but you know there was free. That ticket. was right. That was as soon as they got the twenty thousand signatures to right. yeah. trigger the uh, to trigger the move. Yeah, that was bullshit. I don't. I'm not a big fan of Ian, but uh, you know that was bullshit. What they did to him. Yeah. The fe- the the Free State Project just fucked over a lot of people in the past in similar ways. So yeah, but you talk about Seed Fest possibly being in Tennessee, and coincidentally from Cincinnati, I drove almost five hours to get here. And uh, Cincinnati, like Nashville area, is also about five hours south of from where I'm at. So it'd be the same distance of drive for me. Oh well, then we should definitely do it so we can we can make sure that you are uh, you know not inconvenienced in the least, Shane. I mean. That's right. It works for me. <laughs> so yeah. Well, depending where I end up out in this region, hopefully I won't be that far from it either. I mean, because you know, as 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 the event one of the event organizers, I should probably be um, a little closer than having to drive like you know half a day to get somewhere. Um, but yeah, like I said, I mean, we, we've talked about it forever. Uh, one of these days we'll get it going. By the time we do it, Dave probably won't even be there anyway. Um, but, but that's fine. That may actually make it better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Shit, no, Dave. <laughs> This is what I do. This is why. This is why I enjoy podcasts when Dave, Dave's not available. Now, technically, I probably could have got him to be available, but I didn't want to bother. Um, anyway, um, no. But it, regardless, whether he's there or not, um, you know, I, I think uh, we'll, 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 I'll get it done eventually. I, I, you know, my thing is, like I said, I I prefer to do it on private land, just because the advantages I think that holds. But I'm definitely all down for your plan too, T. You know, we like I said, we talked about this a little earlier uh, before we started recording, and I, I think it's a great idea. And uh, the more people doing it, you know, just like everything else, there's there's so many people coming out of the woodwork. You know, as we were talking about before about Vanu and the Vanuans and Van Nomads and stuff. You know, Shane keeps coming across these people all the time. I, I met two of them on Long Island already in the three weeks that I've been doing this. So there's, it's more and more people, and it's becoming more. It's becoming, you know, it's not mainstream yet, but it's becoming more popular to the point where more people are either getting into it themselves or have been doing it or finally willing to speak to other people about it. And yep. uh, that that just gives me hope because, you know, regardless of people's ideologies, really, if they're if they're at least trying to obtain freedom in this way, as long as they're getting themselves out of the out of the survival society, I mean, that's the, that's the I think that's really the most important thing. And then once um, you know, once they have you know free, more free time to think and to you know study philosophy and shit. Um, so I mean, that's that's kind of the the biggest hurdle is time. People don't you know they go to the go to their nine to five jobs, they get home, they take care of their kids, and um, they really don't have a lot of time to read a, a human action by Mises or something, right? Um, or to have you know some of these conversations. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely a sad state when I think about it. Married life, coming home, you have it's all this. Talking to the mic, get up, get up on that thing. Yeah, I hear you. There you go. That, that's a sad state though when you think about it. You know, you have married life, you come home, and you know. You, you're just trying to deal with the end of day stress, and you can't even focus on freedom. How terrible is that? I mean, that's uh, that, that's the reason why I want to do these TAS zones and all that kind of stuff is because I'd like to see more people get together and be able to 
live as freely as possible as we're doing right now. I mean, there's there's nothing restricting us at the moment. It's beautiful. Uh, except 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 the uh, the gun laws. <laughs> yeah, true. I don't know. I mean, there's no gun law restricting me right now at this moment. Well, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's always... no officer standing around the corner telling me not to do it. No, no, no. He, we, we we only ran into the officer on uh, Wednesday. That was <laughs> yeah, the forest bludge. That was yeah. Uh, oh yeah, it's. Uh, uh, Shane Radliff and I, uh, uh, we, we were supposed to camp outside of the campground the first night, and uh, unfortunately, we the, the landing spot we found, uh, we were kicked out of promptly within like half an hour, uh, and we're told that we we're basically in violation of at least four different laws or regulations or whatnot, um, ranging from you know drinking in public to having my <laughs> having my having murder dog off a leash, um, <laughs> so like you know, and I, I even complained loudly directly after the guy left. Like even in the wilderness, we can't escape these guys. But <laughs> and nobody bothers me in uh, Planet Fitness in Kalamazoo. You know, <laughs> well, I'm just sitting there with my windows open, my dog barking at everybody going by, <laughs> and no one says anything to me. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, nobody says anything to me, but Murder Dog isn't barking, but I have a feeling, you know, if they uh, they may just be scared of Sammy. That's probably why they're just yeah, like, I'm just going to no run doubt. away, and I don't want to get involved in this. And, yeah, that dog is the most aggressive dog I've ever seen. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> such a shame, because she's such a sweet sweetheart when it comes to people, but she <laughs> she's very protective of her space, and she doesn't seem to like other dogs very well. Yeah, I know. She needs a really cool nickname like Murder Dog. I love Murder Dog. I mean, yeah. that's the greatest nickname I've ever heard. <laughs> well, yes, and, and everybody loves Murder Dog. She's always the hit here. I, I swear, every time I come here, it's you know people are more happy to see her than they are me, because she just... She wanders around the campsite most of the time and uh, makes friends. It's, uh, you know, I think, I think Lou, Lou Fien actually was, uh, was asking me if she just should just, you know, get her own tent at this point. Cause she's so independent. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and uh, I did learn that she actually has a homing beacon in her. I never had to test that out, but I learned that because, uh, she decided to start wandering back to the tent from, uh, cl clear on the other side of the camp multiple times because I was trying to watch a presentation and she's just like, oh, I'm just going to start walking. Uh, I think I know where I'm going. You know, she's crossing streets and stuff, stuff, she, stuff she's never done. I, she's getting a little bit bolder in her old age. So, um, yeah, she's having a lot of fun here. I think, I hope. I think she's, yeah, she's still passed out in the tent right now, but that's good. That's good. She needs her rest. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so we have a couple of people. We, have, we actually have a live audience for this one, which is kind of cool. Yeah, we haven't mentioned um, that. Uh, any, anybody else want to uh, hop on the mic while we're here? Uh, I, feel I feel bad Randy Engel came over before, and uh, he ended up uh, walking away because I didn't get to him quick enough. Hopefully, he'll come back again. But, uh, oh, we got somebody want to step up. So, uh, yeah. It's, uh, who, who, do you want to do you want to introduce yourself? Do you want me to introduce you? Do you have a new name that I have to give out? <laughs> um, same, the same non-slave name that I've had. Which is I've only got one. Yes, it's Phoenix. Phoenix. Okay, so we'll go with Phoenix. All right. What's up, Phoenix? I've got a lot of monikers: Liberty Phoenix, you know, Ken Ottinger. That's not okay. really what I choose to be called, but okay, it's Phoenix. What's going on, man? Thanks for joining us. Um, how are you? I am placid and content and apprehensive of going back to deal with the bludgies in the servile society. Did you say flaccid? They make pills for that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think he said placid. Oh, sorry. Put, sorry. As in sorry. peaceful and serene. <laughs> yeah, this is this is home. This uh, I haven't been to one of these in a couple of years. I went to a couple of pork fests, and this has been a long time coming. And it's uh, when you finally get to be with your with your tribe, with your collective, it sounds so disgusting and counterproductive but it's true <laughs> um when you finally find the people that you connect with the people that you resonate with um everything just fits into place and uh you don't have to be concerned like i am extremely absent-minded um my mind is always thinking of something else and something else and something else and analyzing every single aspect and trying to question what whether or not the, the answers that I've gotten are, are accurate to where I forget everything all over the place. I've lost my phone five, six times. or not lost it, but I've forgotten it five, six times all over the campground this whole weekend. And I'm not worried about it in the slightest because I know it's going to be where, wherever I, wherever I left it, I know it's going to be there. Once I backtrack my steps, I know it's going to be there. I know that it's not going to walk off like a banner. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a little uh, in inside fast baseball. Too soon. Uh. <laughs> No, I, I, I love that thing, too. I think I mentioned this in a, a video I recorded the other day, the fact that, 
you know, com- coming to these places is so great for that because you can you can le- you can leave your windows up. I mean, well, granted, it's been rainy for the you know. Luckily, the sun's finally coming out now on Sunday. It's been pretty rainy and cloudy the entire time. But um, normally, when it's nice out, you know, you leave the windows open in your vehicle all the time. Uh, I got a little drunk on tequila with Drew Sample um, the other night, and uh, I ended up uh, needing to take murder dog, put murder dog in the tent, and then run to the bathroom. Uh, and before I th- before I came back, it started raining, so everybody went to bed, and I was so just so tired that I wanted to climb into bed, and I left my tequila and my lime juice and everything, and I woke up in the morning and. Uh, I had, a, I had a mini heart attack and, I, and it actually kind of confused me because I'm like, no, nobody ever takes stuff here because it wasn't where I left it. And it was only because some of the kids got up early that were, that were here and decided to clean up the, can, the, uh, the around the bonfire. And they, they just moved it and they stacked it very nicely on another bench and all my stuff. And it's just, it's such a beautiful thing. Cause you know, I mean, if it's I, not where you left it, it'll be closer to where you're at because the only people that are going to move it are, are going to know what it's, that, it, that it's yours, where you're at and they're going to try to assist you. And you can count on that, you know, 10 times out of 10. I'll go out there and say it 100% of the time. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. And uh, I actually lost my hoodie the other night. And, <laughs> oh, God, uh, this is great. And it's funny because can't find my hoodie, man. I had told Joe, I was like, man, I can't find my hoodie. And so he just kind of spins a 360 and does a quick scan. And he like spots the hoodie and just points at it. And I was like, wow, that's a gift. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> wish I could do that. Oh, he's, yeah, Joe. That's Joe, Joe Mutard, one yeah. of the uh, organizers, I guess. Of the, he's still one of the, is he still on the committee? I don't remember how this yeah, thing works. Yeah, so yeah, so one of the organizers yeah, of the event. Right, uh, we actually had him on the seeds. Uh, couple of years ago to promote the fest we actually we forgot to do that this year i mean we promoted the fuck out of it we kept talking about it as we were leading up to it but same here uh, the past two years we actually had uh, one of the organizers each year come on and uh, you know actually let them talk about it instead of us just babbling on and on and on about it uh we should try to remember to do that for next year because right. um ju- just as last year um, and the year before as the fest is winding down i'm, I'm already making my plans for next year because uh, I plan to be here <laughs> again, just just like this year. As long as I'm not in jail, I'll be here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, getting back to Phoenix, uh, you uh, what should we call it? You know, we were talking earlier about the whole uh, you know hocking your wares and stuff and coming here to these events and stuff like that. Uh, you were doing that this time around. Uh, what uh, did you were, were you successful anyway? I know you uh, were, 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 had a goal in mind. I think all market all market feedback is success. Whether it's good feedback or bad feedback, it's always successful. So it all depends on the perspective of the individual that's receiving that market feedback. The, the entrepreneur that's trying to sell whatever they have, they need to pay attention to what their market's saying. And when I got here, um, I was selling lemon shake-ups, which is lemonade that's shaken for people that aren't from the Midwest. Which I was, Considering this is the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest, there's enough people that didn't understand what a lemon shake-up was. It surprised me. Um, and then I was selling you know, cheeseburgers, hamburgers, um, both of them for like five bucks. Um, I had co- developed coupons. Um, it was my own personal brand of currency called Phoenix Bucks, um, just to drive market, uh, drive traffic, drive traffic. And I think my price point was still set too high because um, five bucks a piece for you know essentially water, lemon juice, and sugar. It's kind of a lot, you know. Um, I was going into it thinking that it'd be more, you know, fest more or not so much fest, but more like like pork fest or um, yeah. carnival style. You know, with the lemon shakeups, I wanted something easy, something quick, and then the burgers. You know, I knew that I had an easy outlet f- to get those cheap, so I figured the price point would be low enough on those. But I expected a hell of a lot more sales. I've it's you know we've got less than twenty four hours till I'm leaving. I probably got a hundred burgers left um, out of forty pounds of meat that I brought so you know it gave me a lot of feedback on what i need to do to better provide for this community next year um and how to make more money by not so much selling better but by preparing to sell better um so like i said i went into it as a level four merchant trying to accomplish a level 20 quest and i think i'm at level 16 now (laughs) Well, that's great. Get it. Just look at that, folks. You get that fun and an ec- economics lesson. You know? <laughs> how, can, how can you go wrong? And especially, you know, we, we mentioned earlier when, when T was on about the, uh, you know, do, doing these type of things for free, which of course is great. But, you know, again, if you want to have a slightly more organized fest, especially if you want to get like big name speakers and stuff, obviously most of them are going to want to know that they have a, an audience that they don't have to like rustle up people. <laughs> like, they, you know, I, I can't imagine Scott Horton flying to someplace and going, all right, I'm here. So uh, just walking around the campsites going, who wants to come to my speech? Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's, he's too busy to do stuff like that. 
you know, so if you want to have an event like this, you obviously have to have uh, some kind of structure like that. But, you know, I mean, that's great, man. You know, I, I, I love the, I love the fact that, uh, you know, I, I was just busting your chops, but I, I know the, I love the fact that you're taking such a positive stance on this, you know. Well, yeah, I took a huge, I took a huge loss. Well, yeah, as far I, I, as like what I spent for, for the weekend and what I made, huge loss. Um, but a lot of that also was setup fees. It wasn't so much... Uh, money that I spent for food or supplies for here, it was the coolers, the 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 canopy, the tables, the chairs. Oh, the, so, stu- so you know, stuff that you would have to use again. Exactly. Yeah, so, stuff you, so that's actually, you know, that doesn't really count in this right. equation. That'll, that'll amortize over the next exactly. five or six festivals. So, so yeah. I'll be able to use it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, make sure it make, make Somebody's going to give me my money back. Do, yeah. I, do I get like a, like, you know, 10% back from everybody at the end of the year. Yeah. Something <laughs> like that. That's how, that's, that's how taxes work, right? That, that's how Patreon works. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get a Patreon account for Shea Phoenix. See, there you go. You should, why not, man? Everybody, I, I think everybody should start a Patreon account. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was, when I was coming here, I was, I was planning on 200 people. And if I sold a hundred burgers and a hundred lemon shakeups at five bucks a piece, that was about a thousand bucks. So that's what I was aiming for. And I think I've made almost 200. So, well, it's not maybe it maybe it's just a, an issue in my perspective of what I was in, expecting to make. Um, which now that I've been here a year, I got uh, you know uh, an uh, an, uh, an amazing amount of market feedback, so I can better prepare it for for next year. So yeah, we did only have about a hundred people that showed up, but a lot of those people did bring a lot of their own food to cook, and so there was I guess a lot of competition in that market. Stay and, on the mic, uh, sir. A lot of competition in that market, <laughs> and there was there was uh, you know there was established merchants uh, like Mister Lou that has this assault oh, kitchen. Yeah, it very. It's, and his, his this quality is so good, and his setup is amazing, and I'm jealous as all hell. Yeah, um, when you're but, when you're competing with the assault kitchen, it's, it's yeah, kind of it's tough. hard. Lou's been working kind of, on that. Had a bad time. I, I got to I got to see the uh, you know the the, the uh, progression of the assault kitchen over the years because. Back at Pork Fest in 2016, he was just starting to like really put it together and call it the Assault Kitchen. And every every festival since then, there's been more improvements and more things he figures he can bring with him. And exactly, and that's just because he's you know he was first to market. He's been able to adapt his product to better suit this environment, and uh, he's been able to establish himself and generate more social capital within all the individuals that attend these festivals to to better attend to their needs and what they want and. Uh, I, as a competitor, need to see where he's lacking in the marketplace and fulfill that. It's not so much uh, that I want to compete with him. I want to find out where he's not providing and provide lacking that. in baked bacon. That, that he definitely <laughs> is. That, that, fry, that commie frying bastard. There's a gap in the market. <laughs> I knew I should have, been, should have done bacon pancakes this year. I, I had it at Porkfest one year. Baked and I was thinking about doing pancakes. it. And then that I could have transferred delicious. the bacon over to the bacon cheeseburgers and... Well, see, Lou, Lou also has the advantage that he has a, a, a little uh, Ancom indentured servant in the uh, oh, in, right. in the form of Nick Hazelton. <laughs> I saw so, that. Uh, he gets uh, he, he get, he gets he gets him to put he gets to put him to work because uh, Nick always shows up at the, when Nick shows up to these fests. You know, he's he's not even twenty years old yet. That young that young whippersnapper. So he shows up at these fests. You know, he wrestles uh, wrestles up some money. I'm not I'm not I'm not going to be surprised if I find out like his dad's been fronting the bill for the plane tickets. Um, you know, <laughs> and then he gets out here. And he just hits everybody up for food. Like Pork Fest was the worst. He was just like all over the place. He's like begging at doors and stuff like that. So yeah, Lou, Lou puts him to work, and then you know, so Nick can eat for free. For being as experienced an entrepreneur as that young man is, I was rather upset that I did not know that he had jerky for sale this entire weekend. I, like, I, I didn't find that out until after his talk. I have been asking Nick for a sample of some type of yak meat for years now <laughs> and for the longest because like I've been friends with him for years we did the we did the Freedom Fiends together for like what well, we were we, we overlapped for like a year and a half I think so we did a bunch of shows together I've had him on my I've had him uh, uh, we've had him on the seeds uh, he I actually picked him up from the airport last year at uh, two years ago at Pork Fest and we spent a lot of time together because it was our first experience both of our first experience there so we hung out a bunch and I've been asking him over and over and over again and he always gave me some bullshit about not wanting you know being too Expensive, and I'm like, dude, I'll pay for the shipping. Just He's charging me. 15 for three ounces of, of jack jerky. Well, that was the thing. I, Apparently, could, could, that's expensive. He, he didn't want to send. He didn't want to send. Uh, 
like he like steaks and stuff like that because he hadn't even thought of doing jerky then and i kept saying why don't you just make some jerky and then you can mail that to me it's like like i don't care like yeah he sent he sent out a sample pack to all of his patrons uh, yeah yeah exactly he did that <laughs> yeah, yeah. but one of his one of his supposed friends who's been asking him please man i've never tasted yak he just sent me some yak you know like and then i get here and i had i found out that he had it with him and i'm like dude you really you, you didn't even bring me any like what the fuck <laughs> like <laughs> Well, damn little bastard. <laughs> you know, that's and that's that shows you know there's a there's a room for growth there and in marketing and and I can learn from his lack in marketing that I didn't know that so it's so, so I can so what you're saying is you're gonna go start a yak farm. farm. <laughs> I, I can capitalize on his you know you know missing that opportunity to market and think where where did I miss on those opportunities to market at you know um, I was I was volunteering for the AV stuff I was helping you know um, organize the uh, the talks and make sure that the mics were hot and the videos running, which happened for the most part. Sorry, Brett. <laughs> My apologies. For the most part, yeah. Um, you know, somebody remember that memory yesterday. cards have a, have a limit. Yes. Um, and uh, so I could have taken the, those opportunities to jump on stage after the talks. Hey, you know, the, I'm Phoenix. I'm selling burgers and, and lemon right, shakeups. Yeah. I never took advantage of that, you know. And no, no one's going to stop me. No one would resent me for that. Not in the slightest. In fact, people would be, would have appreciated it. Um, but you know, it's 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 having to to reanalyze your position to see where could you have done better and not resent yourself or feel bad about it well, because it's only, all a learning process. I would only make one suggestion, and that would be uh, pepper jack cheese. Okay, I can <laughs> certainly do that. That's my favorite. <laughs> all right, look at that. More uh, more market feedback as we as we uh, 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 live on. Uh, like, uh, yeah, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was sort of starting to mix metaphors in my head and stuff, and I'm uh, just like, forget it. Anyway, so what, what was your guys' favorite part of the uh, of the of the weekend so far? Like, what what really got your emotions flowing to to you know overcome your your rational brain and say, oh my god, I'm home. Well, I say that as soon as I pull up, uh, or even when I get even close, I'm like, oh, I'm home. Uh, I I don't know. It's kind of a toss up. Get, getting a chance to meet Scott Horton and smoke a joint with the man who's kind of freaking cool I think that was amazing I, I was standing <laughs> yeah there. you were there yeah, too <laughs> that was, that was great. Like standing next to Scott as he before he goes on the stage just like feeling like his hype man like just you know smoking up in front of the entire audience like we're not off to the side there's no there's no wings like we're just uh, chilling right here he's getting MC introduced and it was it was that was amazing that was absolutely amazing T I think you had something yeah, mine was definitely rainbow on a tripod right out here in the center over by the campfire. That was absolutely beautiful. Like when she started that in the morning, just completely spontaneous. All the kids gathered around. Everybody started watching. Uh, what was she doing? That aerial, it was aerial yoga. Aerial yoga. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't think we've discussed who she is. I mean, you want to go ahead and let your listeners know who that is. I I don't even really. I never I met know. her, so I don't even. <laughs> this I, I don't know that she goes by the name of Rainbow. I think they said her name is Courtney, though. But she yeah, she came here to uh, perform this uh, aerial yoga stuff. She did, she did it a bunch of times. I, gave, I think she gave some classes in it. Yeah, it took uh, a couple of them. Yeah, I I actually saw. I was I was impressed. I I, I gave you I gave you a nice a nice <laughs> golf clap after I saw you do it because I kept I kept I kept thinking you were just about pulling my leg when you said you were going to try it, but no, you did. And I did I, I did over here. Did I not over here that she said you were the first person who was able to perform that one move without fall on the first try yeah yes yeah, this uh, there was a specific sequence um where it's a lot of upper body strength and you know I, I was in the marine corps but that was like you know i got out of there in 2015 14 and like i have really i don't work out i don't do none of that shit i'm fat old 35 year old broken guy that hurts all the time and you know i was not expecting that to be as easy but she was like yeah i was i went up there and i was like yeah, let, give me something hard and apparently you know Oh, I'm, I I took to it like a duck to water, but I'm I'm doing it to you know help bolster my daughter's um you know uh, to encourage her her liking of that that stuff because when I showed her to her before I came here she was, she was really interested in Rainbow Flight so I was like you know I got to do everything I can to you know make that a positive uh, thing in her eyes when I get back. Huh? I, that's it. Well, that's even better. I thought you were just doing. I thought you were just doing because you wanted to try it. That's it, <laughs> man. That, I ended up that buying one of them. That was beautiful. That was great. Was great. Yeah, I ended up buying one of her uh, one of her hammock rigs. Oh, nice. Um, and they've got a an old wooden um, swing, you know, chair swing, out in the front of their house, so I can set it up right there, and me and her can you know go ahead and practice it. Oh, that's fantastic. So yeah. maybe you know in five years she'll be here doing her own routine. Well, that that would that would be great. And 
five years from now, I still plan on coming as long as this fest is still going <laughs> on. But, um, but no, that's that's really great, man. And on top of everything else, like you know, vendors helping, you know, vendor vendors purchasing from vendors, vendors helping each other out. You know, that's great, man. You keep all the productive capacity within the community, and you don't have any. You know, you minimize the amount of productive capacity going out to the servile society, and you just enrich all the lives of the people within that community. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, anybody else who's out in the audience want to get on? Chris, can we finally drag you on here? Yeah, you he's been, he's really he's, quick. Oh, well, well, uh, well, uh, yeah, Chris, well, Chris, Chris to preempt Chris, you know, you guys were talking about the van nomadism, yes. nomadism stuff. Um, after 2016, when I uh, my last year of Porkfest, I actually tried it out for a couple of months, and I uh, lived in my van. It was pretty awesome. I had my hammock that I bought at Porkfest just stretched out from the front to the back of the van. It was it was it was a lot of fun. So, cool. oh, awesome. Nice. Well, so we'll, we'll have to talk more about that at some point because uh, we love uh, talking about all these different experiences people have had. So yes, so uh, yeah, he, he's busy at the moment, but, but we're now being joined by, uh, by by our friend Chris, who was uh, who Shane and I, were, Shane Randolph and I, were supposed to meet up with before the <laughs> fest to do a little uh, camping and just uh, do some van nomad and stuff. Because uh, Chris has been doing this for for quite a while now, and. Uh, the stories, just the stories I've heard from him, and the stuff that, uh, just the stuff I picked up from me, hanging around you and talking to you, and uh, you know, passing comments back and forth on Steam over the past couple of weeks, uh, it's been great, man. Because uh, you like, I just see how much you enjoy this lifestyle, right? And uh, you, I you love wanna, it. You, you want it. You, you want to tell, uh, you, you want to tell us, uh, tell the audience, uh, you know, a little, little bit about what your experiences, what, how, what, 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 you, what you've been up to, what you, what you live in, and all that type of deal. Okay, uh, I live in a. Um Nissan Xterra. It's an SUV. It's a 2003. And uh, I set out on the road uh, somewhere in the spring of 2014. Uh, I've been doing this for about four and a half years now. And uh, traveled all over the United States uh, from coast to coast. From Went into Mexico one time. Traveled up uh, to, of course, uh, Washington and New England, Maine. So I've been from kind of, I haven't been to Florida yet, so I haven't been to all the four points, you might say. Uh, but I've been to Florida before in my life. Uh, Florida's too humid. I try to stay in places where the weather's, the climate is, is nice. And, uh, the, you know, I, I look for places where it's somewhere between like 50 degrees and about uh, 80 degrees. That's my plan. To get away from the Texas heat. I've spent 57 years in the sweltering Texas heat, and I wanted to get away from that. That was one of the reasons I left. Um, mainly, I, I, I've always had a uh, kind of a wandering nature since childhood. I've always dreamt about doing this kind of thing. Always wanted to travel. Uh, never was able to travel. My parents uh, never traveled anywhere. We always went to the same place every year for our, our vacation to the coast somewhere near Corpus Christi called Port Aransas. And, uh, you know, that was kind of boring, you know, after you do it every year. And uh, I always watched, I uh, had an uncle that had an, uh, uh, an RV, uh, you know, trailer. And he would come visit us every now and then. I always saw that and was dreaming about doing that myself one day. But then when I kind of grew up, I uh, don't want to pull anything behind me. That's kind of a drag to have that thing pulling behind you, you know, a trailer behind you. I kind of want more freedom. So right. I decided to do it and then did it in an SUV and... Uh, I kind of, it's kind of like living in a submarine in a way. Um, you know, small space, you have to be a minimalist. And uh, But I'm okay with it. I'm, I like it. I, it's, I love being in nature. That's the other reason I do this. I love seeing um, nature and geographical areas, you know, all the uh, beautiful scenery that you see in America and Mexico too and Canada. I haven't been into Canada yet as far as since on this trip, but uh, I left my passport. At, and my storage space in Austin, Texas. I usually have a seven, five by seven storage unit there, and uh, I kind of uh, one day I want to get rid of that. I won't even have that. I just want to have everything I own in my my SUV. That's my plan. Um, but anyway, I left my passport there by accident. Otherwise, I'd try to venture maybe up into Canada while I'm on I'm this area. But I'm not going to be yeah. able to do it this time. The uh, you know the state won't let you travel freely. That's unfortunate. Yeah, so have you ever been out to uh, the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous in Quartzsite, Arizona, or Slab City? I've been to Slab City, yeah. I visited really? Slab City, but Quartz, I didn't know about that until you told me about it, Shane. And, you know, I really would love <laughs> to do that. That's something I'm going to try to make this year and see you down there, you know, I hope. And that's in January, right? 
I, th- I think it's in January. Yeah. Yeah. You want to describe yeah. that a little in a little more detail, Shane? For uh, <laughs> so ba- so basically, it's uh, a a van nomad meetup put together by a guy that owns a channel called uh, Cheap RV Living. Uh, I don't remember his name off the top of my head. Bob Wells. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, T. Um, but uh, yeah, he put it together, and um, there were I think four thousand attendees uh, this year. So like, it's uh, it's a pretty major event, and it's like a week long thing. People just riding dirt bikes around in the desert and chilling and talking about you know the philosophy behind you know van nomadism and all that sort of stuff. And it looks it looks awesome. It looks awesome. Yeah, I I too had never heard about it until you mentioned it, but I think I I, I think it's great. I mean. Obviously, I, I don't, as I've said, I, I don't plan on doing, well, I'd, I'd like to actually do this a little longer, but, you know, eventually it'd be a lot easier on me if I get to hang out with my kids and stuff and actually be in the same place as they are, um, you know, and then although we've, we've been talking about this weekend that my, my goal, you know, I, I've talked a bunch about, you know, once I finally am able to move out of New York, my plan is to get to, well, I kept seeing Indiana, but of course, since I got here, there's been a bunch of people I've talked to who, of course, try to keep to extol, keep trying to extol the virtues of other nearby states and trying to convince me to move there instead. Uh, so we may yet still be completely undecided, but at the very least, I, I think we're going to move to Indiana to start and uh, a rent a place. But as I've talked about, my my long term goal is to start up a farm and a bison ranch. But I I want to my my you know in an ideal world I'll set it up and get it running and get the experience because I, I want to get involved in every aspect of all that stuff including even you know slaughtering my own uh, slaughtering my own bison and uh, w- once I get uh, adept enough with all that stuff I, I would really like to be able to turn over most of the work to other people you know hire people to run the place so that I can start traveling again and this time with my fa- you know with the family and actually put the girls and you know. We may have to step up from the element. I, I don't know if all of us will fit in there. <laughs> yeah. um, but I guess, uh, I, guess, I guess necessary, yeah. Yeah, I'm but sure I, your wife will go forward. Yeah, it's, uh, she I, has to live in that with the whole family. Yeah, yeah I think. Uh, oh, you know, I was just talking about the kids. I guess I have to bring her. Maybe uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, but he, I mean, I, I think though, for me, I, I know we've talked about this and. Uh, in, in other situations, I, I you know, you, Shane, you've said that you've come, you have come across families who do this, although they almost, almost exclusively live in RVs instead of trying to pull it off in like some kind of small conversion van or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, a couple is fine in a Sprinter van, but if you're going to have a family, I mean, you're talking, you know, what class C campers at least. If yeah, not, if not bigger than that. Yeah. Which, which I'm not, which I'm not, uh, I'm not opposed to. I mean, obviously, you can't do like the the fun stealth camping like I've been trying to do, like I've been doing off and on for the past couple of weeks. But and uh, you, you know you 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 probably end up having to spend a little more money at the different RV yeah. parks because that's that's always the most convenient place to park where you have you know you can just pull into a slot you have electricity you have water um, and unless you're battle unless you're battle row in in uh, in Hempstead New York in Bethpage New York you bastards you have showers like like civilized human beings uh, <laughs> I'm still mad about that place such a rip off fifty seven dollars a night not even you know. Not even showers in the place. Yeah, come on, that's ridiculous. Um, what kind of campsite is that? But, uh, yeah, uh, so, so yeah, that would be my goal. You know, that I mean, that is that is my goal. I I, I hope to accomplish that one to be able to start traveling around with them and uh, doing like this. I, I I talked about this with uh, Kyle Turnblazer on on one of my uh, one of my abolitionist subtractions episodes about the whole idea of doing unschooling on the road with the kids. So like obviously I would have to get a move on with this because my kid you know I'd have to start doing it before my kids are out of you know school age or whatever, um, but yeah I, I would love to be able to do that and travel around and, and not just do you know because my, my plan is once I get to Indiana I'm sp- I'm supposed to finally get to play stay at home dad so I I you know I'm going to be taking them out and doing things and you know go out in nature and going out in the world and experiencing everything but it'd be even cooler if I could experience even more of the world. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know, taking your kids out. Uh, hey, bring that a little closer to your face. Uh, pe- you know, taking your kids out in nature is uh, very important, and uh, it's sort of like you know, you know they'll gain so much more worldliness on in traveling too. I mean, that's you know, that's a that's the learning experience. You gain so much knowledge from traveling, and uh, you kind of, uh, 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 yeah, it's it's uh, a well-being that you can't get any other way when you're a child. I think too. Uh, it's kind of changes their whole way of looking at things, and um, I wish I could have done that when I was a kid. I kind of that's kind of the reason I kind of do this now too. I'm sort of like miss that in my childhood, and so now I'm doing that now. I'm going kind of recreating what I wish I would have been able to do in my childhood. So I'm kind of living that for that reason too. 
Yeah, I, I'm actually with you on that. I mean, in my case, I guess that's kind of like, you know, imposing my childhood on my on my children too mm. but to some extent yeah like i'm giving the like because i i grew up in in pennsylvania in like you know the mountains of pennsylvania and i actually lived um the property behind mine which was pretty huge actually was a farm and i had a friend who lived there but his family never used the farm for like they bought it they bought the property you know at long after the last farmer had kind of let everything kind of go kind of go and they just never bit that bothered to do anything with it so this is you know pretty big farmland and uh there's never any farm there and i used to look at wilt well you know when i was a kid and i would just imagine what it would be like to actually be on a farm and uh i, I kind of always wanted to do that because that's you know one of the reasons that that's my goal at the current moment is because as i've talked about before this is something i plan on doing much later in life pretty much for the similar reasons to what you're what you're talking about like it was something i wanted to do and wanted to experience when i was younger and didn't get the opportunity to so i figured i could try to recreate it much later in my life and then when the opportunity kind of arose through a whole set of diff different circumstances in the past couple of years i decided to take the oppor you know, opportunity to do it now and uh you know but it, a lot of it is too like i, I think I just think my kids would benefit so much from it because I see enough from, uh, you know, just the different unschooling kids I meet and stuff like that. Um, e even if they're not traveling constantly, even if they're, you know, if they have one stationary place that they, you know, are usually a lot more, uh, well, you know, well, well-rounded at a, a lot more younger age. Um, even more so the ones like you're talking, like you were saying, Chris, if you, you know, allow them to travel and experience even more of the world, uh, they, they're able to, you know, pick up things because most people, most kids, don't, most people don't give their kids enough credit. They think, you know, there's like, there's these su su stupid so, uh, societal accepted standards of like when kids are supposed to be able to learn things, what's appropriate for kids at what age. And it's gotten so insane over time that, you know, they, 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 they try to like baby everybody and uh, obviously always uh, play to the lowest common denominator. So, you know, most people, uh, like I said, most people take kids, uh, don't get, take kids as seriously as they should. I've, you know, I've, I've said for the longest time, Mike, I kept trying to tell everybody in my family and my, uh, and, 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 and in the wife's family that the, uh, you know, our kids were, were, were a lot smarter than everybody was getting them credit for. And, you know, I know most people say, oh, my kid's so smart and stuff like that. And I was like, no, no, they, they really are. They remind me of me when I was a kid. And I was really, I was really destructive because I was, so, I, my family all knew it. Like I knew how to, I, I thought a lot of, I, I'm very far ahead of my age. So I could figure things out that they were just like, they were not prepared for it. Cause like, how, how the hell, why would we think you would be doing this stuff? This is stuff like, like five and six year olds pull and I'm like two and three are doing it. So I saw that same stuff in my kids and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, uh, being able to, being able to give them these experiences there, they, they can, you know, they can process so much more than people give them credit for. And I think, uh, giving them these opportunities, even though, like I said, part uh, partially, like, I guess imposing what I would like to see on them. But, you know, they're getting old enough now that if they really don't like it, then we'll, I'll try to find something else to accommodate them because I don't want to, like, force them into a lifestyle. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's going to make it a little more inconvenient, but I, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, just being able to get outside for them on a more regular basis and getting in a different setting and... Uh, because, unfortunately, because of where we've lived and because of the problems that uh, we've had with both sides of the fam both sides of the family over the years, they don't have a lot of tight relationships as it is. So it's not like they're, it's not like they're you know we're having to start over for much. So hopefully they'll uh, be able to pick up uh, wherever we go, and then and then and then they'll be even more well rounded by the time we get to go on the road again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's a learning experience. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, yeah, well, I mean, every, I mean, everything's a learning experience for them, but uh, yeah, definitely. I think like, like, you know, like we're saying, getting them out there and being able to travel. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely wish I could have done that as a kid. You know, I, I, even, even, even though I, you know, I'm, I'm old enough that I, I came around before, you know, TVs in the car and like, I think it was only in my later teenage years that I finally had a Game Boy if I went anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, I lived all pre that, pre all that. I still never minded long car trips. I was actually the, usually the only one who really didn't care unless, uh, unless I really had to pee and my dad was being a pain in the butt about it. We just stopped. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, ne I never really wanted to, I, I never really had the desire to travel as a child, strangely enough. I mean, I moved around every, basically every four years of my life until I was in high school. So, I mean, I, that's not a nomadic lifestyle by any means, but I'm just used to that sort of change, um, you know, pretty drastic, you know, going through school, um, government, uh, you know, government indoctrination and all that. But, um, yeah, I never, I never really had that desire to travel. It was, it was really just, 
um, you know, his Rayo, his recognition that, you know, nomadic lifestyles make one more invulnerable to coercion. Um, it makes sense. So that's basically, I saw the efficacy of it and I guess going on some practice runs and, you know, watching a bunch of different case studies, I, I think the lifestyle is uh, just really, really incredible. Yeah. Well, uh, we're, we're all fans, obviously. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, everybody uh, uh, thinks about taking a road trip when they're young. And my first road trip across the U.S., uh, well, it's from Texas to California, was when I was in college, in my early 20s. That was the first time I actually took a road trip. I think everybody should do that. They should get in their car and experience, you know, that venture because it's uh, somewhat spontaneity and you don't know what to expect. It's kind of an adventure. Even if it's just one time. Oh, yeah, you have to yeah. do it one time. Yeah. And then, I don't know, that's not for everybody, obviously. Uh, this lifestyle is not for everybody. Um, but still, it, it adds to your worldliness, I think, too, to be able to do this kind of thing. Um, you know, you got to see see life and away from your bubble. you got to get away from that and uh, get a new perspective. It opens up your mind. Yeah, that's why I'm, get, that's why I'm getting out of Illinois. Yeah. I loved seeing your, your videos about your practice runs, Shane, man, because I could see it in your eyes, man. It was like, there was a little bit of doubt and fear at the same time, and, <laughs> and, uh, but I could see that, you know, you were going, hmm, this feels good. I could tell, I could see it yeah. in your face, you know? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty great, even, the th even in the 35 degree weather, you could be sleeping in my vehicle, yeah. it was still, it was still just a, a great time hiking around and, you know, just didn't have to be anywhere, didn't have to do anything, I could just do what I wanted to, so... That yeah. freedom and flexibility is really, really what it's all about. I mean, the, I've had jobs that I've liked, but it's just the fact that, you know, from this time to this time, every single day, basically, I've got to be there on their time. And that just doesn't feel right to me. Um, if I if I don't want to do something that day, I mean, as, as silly as it may sound, I, I, I want to do what I want to do. And I get, you know, inspired at different times to do different things. So being on that strict schedule, I mean, I, I also, I would sit, you know, um, I'd sit at work at times and put together podcast episodes because I'd just be in that creative spirit where I'd be ready to go. And um, that lack of flexibility, you know, was not good for, I don't know what I really cared about. If that makes sense? <laughs> well, you know, uh, it's easy for me because I'm in the, at the retirement age. And this is something a lot of retired people do. You know what I do. But sure. they do it on a little more grand level. They get in the RV. Yeah, they, they get they, the big they, RV. They pull, and they have a wife and they have to, you know, satisfy her needs. And uh, when you're alone, it's a little different. But when you're young, I really admire people that do it when they're young. Because uh, that was always something I wish I would have been able to do. And I got tied down, uh, you know, in my other life with, with a wife and, uh, and a house and a business and all that thing. And... Um, wasn't quite to the point of self-awareness like I am now. And uh, so, yeah, it's like it's good that you get that at a young age. You should, everybody should venture out. Put a backpack on and go. Even if it's not in your car, get in and put a backpack on and, and adventure. Do an adventure. Yeah, and, and thankfully that, that is kind of the mindset of a lot of, um, I guess, people my age is that they see, I guess, the way the system is laid out in front of them. And, uh, they're, they're, you know, they high school, college, you know, work until you're 65, then you can retire and do whatever you want to. And a lot of folks are thinking, well, I'm in a lot better shape now or I could do, you know, really incredible things like go surfing or, you know, spend every winter skiing or, or things like that. I, I can't do that when I'm 65 and retired or might not be able to if, you know, my body's not physically able. So. Hey. I, I I surfed uh, maybe a year or so ago for the really? first time. Yeah, I was in Mexico and I took some surfing lessons. Awesome. And it was very spontaneous. I wasn't expecting it. It was like I just went along with some other guys. We were in an Arcapulco, and we you know we decided to go someplace afterward. And uh, we went up the coast, uh, and uh, uh, they were going for the purpose of surfing. And you know I had no intention of doing trying it out myself. And when I saw it, I says, "Okay, I'm going to do this too," and did it. And I was an old guy, you know, so, you, you know, you can do it at any age. I think you can learn to do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I've talked about, uh, you know, one of, one of the reasons I, I kind of jumped on this opportunity is because, like you said, uh, you know, like you're saying, Chris, I, I this is an op something I never took advantage of when I was younger, before I had kids and stuff like that. And while I could wait to try to do it later, when the opportunity, like, 
presented itself, I figured, why not take it now, just in case something happens down the road, you know, kind of like this weekend where we had a bunch of stuff planned to do. And, you know, we didn't we didn't get it out of the way when we had the time and the weather was a little better. And now, like the last day, it's like, ah, crap, we ran out of time. Cause we didn't. But just, just so you know, though, Brett is over there interviewing Prof. CJ right now. So Oh, figures. That's why neither of them are here. There was Prof. CJ said he was coming down to talk to us and now they're interviewing each other. Thanks, guys. Thought we were friends. What happened? <laughs> Man, anyway. They've been sitting there for a while, too. I should have mentioned it earlier. Yeah, but. That's all right. I'll get over it. Oh, I wanted to say, it's an honor to be on your podcast because I've been watching you guys for many years, both you guys, Shane and, J- and Jay. And uh, so it was really great to, to meet you, you know, in person and hang out. And you've inspired me to, uh, you know, to do some podcasts on my own or vlogs, at least. You know, I've been doing a little bit of that. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of uncomfortable with this. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of neat to be here. It's an honor. Thanks. Well, you're, you're, uh, you, see, you seem quite, quite comfortable behind the mic right now. So uh, <laughs> you, you've, well, you've, st- you've, stuttered, you've stuttered and stumbled a lot less than the, than the host has. So, you know, I, I think you're doing all right. Well, you know why? Because I, I, I think it's because I'm talking about things I love. So it's easy. Well, that's, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Exactly, yeah. Well that's, uh, well, that's actually one of the reasons that I ended up not, uh, I ended up spending a lot more time doing things other than I planned because I spent a lot of time talking to people about dogs this weekend <laughs> because unfortunately, uh, you know, like I said, murder dogs here, murder dogs had a lot of fun but unfortunately most of the other dogs here have been uh, female aggressive females and uh there's been a there's been a couple of tussles uh murder uh, murder dog actually got into one herself but that was actually that that was kind of my fault because i i let that happen i actually encouraged that and said we could test something out and you know she learned her lesson and ran away and she was fine no 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 blood you know no harm no foul she was good um but there's been you know a bunch of dogs just you know everybody's cranky um so i've actually had a lot of sit down conversations and uh same thing i just you know i could talk about those for things for hours and i don't stutter as much (laughs) i don't stumble (laughs) over my words i don't i don't lose my train of thought as easily um no matter how high i am i could just go and go (laughs) and go um but yeah man yeah you should you know like i said uh, when i introduced you you know since i've since i've gotten to know you uh you know first through uh you know social media type conversations and then once we got to hang out um you just seem so like you know it was so uh evident that you were so happy you know th- you know r- legitimately happy with this lifestyle and uh it just get you know it, it, it anytime i meet anybody like this it gives me hope yeah. you know like i said before i think you know the, the fact that this thing seems to be growing i mean the fact that i've come across two people already in long island you know other than me that are doing this type of thing <laughs> which is uh the, sometimes the hard i mean in some aspects it makes life easier but in some aspects it's the harder way to do it if you're doing city or ver- or, or uh, suburban vibe new as, as it's right. referred to that you know you're you're trying to do this where you have to try to conceal yourself in uh, in in the open a lot more um because i don't have a lot of woods to run to unfortunately and uh i'm pretty much a threat in in almost every corner of the damn county of getting uh get, unless i'm on somebody's pro- uh, pro- private property who's allowed me there uh it, getting arrested for indecent exposure if i try to take my solar shower out even <laughs> e- even if i wear my bathing suit while i did it which was always my plan i always said i was if i set up in like one of the public parks or something if because especially the one uh there's one there's one near me that i've talked about in a lot of my vlogs about that has a dog park that i don't like to go to because the people there are horrible but it has these two great hills that i used to hang out and party with on a kid uh, as kids and they're kind of they're the only one of the only parts of the park that's really surrounded by trees so i know i could could totally go up there and most likely at most times a day nobody really goes up there anymore it's only usually on the weekends when there's a when when people bring out and have like uh because it's one of those places that people go to have free you know like family reunions and giant picnic parties and whatever stuff like that and uh apparently birthday parties too there was people that are doing that i forgot, I forgot people, people did that but anyway aside from that there's usually everybody nobody up there but if somebody was to put, stumble upon me i'd still get it slammed with a decent exposure if i was wearing my bathing suit so like it does make it a little more difficult but like i said the fact that there's i've already come across in just three weeks i well, actually technically two because i haven't seen i haven't seen my new friend in about a week so it, yeah about two weeks yeah i, I stumbled across two other people that are doing this so it's kind of crazy and uh, I'm just I'm I'm happy to keep meeting more people, and this is this has been a, such a great experience, especially getting to hang out with with Chris and T here, um, you know, and just uh, talk about this stuff and uh, and see the excitement in other people's eyes, especially with you, Shane, because like you gave a presentation on uh, on all like the second realm stuff and like yeah. that, and uh, there's people obviously here who are fans of your podcast or just heard about it and are very interested, and I heard I heard a lot of questions getting asked of all you guys, which is you know great. 
And uh, I got, you know, I got a lot of questions too, obviously, mostly from people who've known me already. You're like, so you're really doing this? So <laughs> how does this work? Um, but it's, you know, you get that. It's great because you see, you see the, the excitement. People, people, a lot of folks haven't seen that as an option, um, you know, personally. And when they see someone they know doing it, it's like, okay, maybe there's some stock in this. Let me figure out. Let me, let me learn a little bit more about it. Um, so I think it's, it's all good. It's all really good. Yeah. And of course, you know, like we said, the, the, with, with, these, the, with these type of fests and stuff, and hopefully more of them in the future, um, there'll be plenty of places for, peop- for people who want to try this lifestyle out or, or looking to do it on a more permanent basis to go to constantly. You'll never be bored. <laughs> you could yeah, destroy- literally, you could, you could set, like I, and this is what I plan to do, is just plan my travels around the freedom festivals that are happening. And I mean, t- shit, I mean, you could probably have one a month and then just travel around, you know, to different places. Um, you know, within you know, within those three weeks or so. I mean, there's so many possibilities with this lifestyle. Blockchain conferences for a certain project I'm working on. Mm-hmm. If I need to get just do presentations or anything, uh, it, it it all works right into this. So, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's actually, and I I mean, I actually met somebody. I, I don't even think he had a. He may have had a car. He was probably living out of his car. So yeah, technically, he was he was essentially one of one of one, one of us. One of us. One of us. <laughs> um, it, I met him at a pork fest a couple of years ago. I can't forget the guy's name, but he was uh he was the dab dude. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what you know. That's what he did. He you know just just festival hopped all year long, and uh, hocked his wares wherever wherever he went, and uh, made enough money to cover the cover his expenses and everything, and a little extra. Cash and then moved on and uh he i mean he was telling me a couple of years ago that it was already possible then there was enough of these things going on and uh, he wasn't even he wasn't even getting into the whole bitcoin you know conferences type of stuff like you're talking about um i mean i'm sure some of those guys would be interested in what he had to sell but uh it doesn't seem, sure. seem like the place to where, where he would usually hang out but anyway uh so let's see we've been going for geez a little over, a little over two hours well almost two hours and 45 minutes we're Good almost deal. we're almost we're oh, no, two hours and 15 minutes i was gonna say we're almost at our longest but that's not that's not right because we have an episode with lou for the past but that was almost three hours um but i don't want to kill the fans that much with uh some you know since we're just coming back now after after the week off but uh anybody else uh, have anything else to say for, from the audience anybody else want to come back up or something before we uh, before we get going closing this out we're probably going to do another one of these today so we have uh, another episode maybe we'll finally get CJ and Brett over here um, but uh, yeah anybody anybody I, I just want to say that um, if you have the opportunity to get to you know these festivals these second realms and you haven't been to one do your damnedest to get out to it, it I don't care which one it is just get out there and realize that uh, you know, others like you actually exist in physical space and time and not just on the internet. And you can make connections and get, you know, started on really incredible projects, you know, working towards freedom. I mean, there's so many, pl- so many positives to attending these festivals, these, these to, to coming to these second realms that, um, you, you have to get out there. I, I don't care what the reason is that you're kind of hesitant, but just, you know, get out there. You owe it to yourself to experience this. Yeah. yeah just, you know, the first time I experienced uh, other anarchists, I guess it was, uh, Anarchapulco. I went to the very first one. And it was so, wow, it felt so good to be around people that, like mind, that are like-minded. And so that's part of it, being around people you're like mind, that have a uh, like mind about many things. It's sort of, mm-hmm. you know, that's a totally another world that you haven't experienced all your life. You know, for the first time, you might meet other people that agree with you on many things. And, uh, yeah, do it. <laughs> Just do it. Just do it, man. I don't have much of a, a discourse to, to engage in, but Shane, there's one of the things that I love about your show, and it's the definitions. And so if you could give us a definition of the uh, the second, what do you call it? The second, uh, second realm. The second the second realm. realm. What, what What's the second realm, the difference between the first and second? Yeah, Is so there a third and fourth? Um, yeah, Does it have anything no, to do with interdimensional <laughs> beings? No. Get on my astro plane, bitch. <laughs> no, it does not. So... Um, so the first realm is everything that the, that anarchists despise. It's the culture of, um, it's the culture of collectivism. It's the culture of, um, uh, you know, anti, anti propertarianism. Um, it's the, it's the stuff that we despise, the violence, the coercion, the war, um, the fraud, those sorts of things, the, the initiation of force. Uh, whereas the second realm and, uh, the second realm uh, in hashtag Agora is defined as technically the second realm is described uh, described as encrypted uh, encrypted communication, encrypted currencies, anonymous and pseudonymous identities, and untraceable action. Um, and 
updated version of, or I guess a, a different definition, uh, an updated version of temporary autonomous zones TASAs, essentially the ability to conduct trade and other activities, including vices in certain areas at particular times without reprisal from the state. Uh, TASAs were originally conce conceived of as geographically mobile, uh, like Vanu shelters, yet now it may include cyberspace such as the deep web. So second realms can be physical or digital. They can be freedom festivals where, where we are right now. They can also be, uh, you know, like the Silk Road or the uh, hashtag Agora, Deep Web IRC chat. Um, those would all be considered examples of second realms. So, so, it's, so it's not necessarily in real life? <clears throat> it can be in, uh, so, um, uh, so uh, Phoenix asked stuff, so it can be, uh, it, it can, it doesn't have to be in real life. Yeah, it can be in cyberspace as well. Um, like Open Bazaar, the... Uh, Decentralized peer-to-peer -peer exchange, the the newest iteration of the Silk Road, that's an example of a digital second realm. It, ex it I mean, you it, it it exists in physical it, it the products exist in physical space, but yeah, that exists in cyberspace. So, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Cool. Uh, T, did you have something else you wanted to add? Yeah, guys. Um, anytime you get a chance, don't give the government your money. Figure out ways around <laughs> it. Uh, those Hell guys yeah. are just gonna bomb, like bomb brown people to death all the time, and uh, it's just not worth spending your money on. Find other ways. Give it to your neighbors. Give it to your friends. Give it, give to, it to your, your fellow anarchists. Give it to your fellow a uh, Vanuins. <laughs> God bless you, Shane. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for your podcast, by the way. Yeah, just go out there and figure out a way not to give government your money. That's. Uh, I'm all for that. So, uh, hey, Randy, you want to come and sit in, Randy? <laughs> uh, we're going to close it out soon, but you want to come sit in for a bit? Oh, come on, man. <laughs> well, before we close Randy, out. Randy, Randy. Uh, all right, Shane, what do you, what do you got? Over well, there? I just wanted to say to uh, to Phoenix and uh, Mr. T. <laughs> Mr. T. <laughs> Chris, to the talking to the mic, son. To Phoenix and Mr. T and Chris and uh, everyone else who's you know attending the festival for the first time. Uh, or even just making new connections for the first time after being here, you know, many years. I just want to say welcome to the Ann fam, to everyone here. You're one of us now. One of us. <laughs> one of us. <laughs> I thank all of you guys. All right. All right. Well, so, if, so if, if Randy England is not going to come up and join us, then I guess we will get closing out. Uh, Rad, Radliff over there, you got anything else you want to say in closing, brother? Not really. I just, just you know, find freedom now. Fuck right. political crusading. All right, we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll pl plug your shit before we get going. Then. Yeah, <laughs> libertyintertech.com, vonnypodcast.com if you want to find out how to be free now. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. I, I, I highly recommend that. So. Could I do a plug? Oh, absolutely. Yes, Chris, uh, please uh, pl pl plug away, my friend. Okay, well, I, I've got a, uh, uh, I guess, like a vlog uh, on uh, Steemit and uh, DTube. I'm the wandering agorist. I go also by the wandering voluntarist. And so come check out my stuff too. Uh, yeah, see yeah. what life's on the road well, on the road is like. You know, it's not really van life, but it's sort of you know SUV life. Yeah, we we it's we, an all encompassing. We, yeah, we use the term hashtag. van nomadism. <laughs> yeah, we we use van life and van nomadism as you know just to cover a whole bunch of things that people like us are doing. So yeah, yeah we, someone in RV can be living the van nomad life. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes, but that, yeah, that'll be uh, steamit.com slash at wandering agorist, but I'll make sure to throw that in the show notes too. Yeah, we all learn from each other, so uh, it's it's good, you know, to, you know right. check out stuff, you know, that other people are doing because you can always learn more that way too. Uh, absolutely. I mean, as I said to you before, I mean, I, the, the, I've learned an amazing amount of stuff from you in the, in the, in the month or so since we first connected on Steamit. It's, or, well, actually, since you first uh, reached out to me on YouTube. Um, so yeah um, alright uh, on that note we will get closing out this has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast all of our information can be found at solpodcast.org and at steamit.com slash at Seeds of Liberty um, our Patreon is still up and running uh, I do apologize I did warn you guys but uh, we're, we've been a little short on episode, Patreon episodes lately but it's kind of difficult to do a whole bunch of the stuff on the road I, I will sort that out soon enough and we'll start pumping out again but thank you everybody who continues to donate and for those of you who are not please consider oh, oh screw it just get on it people come on we still only ask for a dollar a month and you get access to pretty much everything we put out there and we do put out a ton of content on there so anyway uh thanks again everybody and uh we will be back next week and uh maybe we'll have dave and uh D dave and uh, shane with uh, dave and andre with us or maybe we'll have another episode for the mpl fest we'll see but one yeah we'll see we'll, we'll see what happens but either way we'll be back so thanks folks we'll catch you next time peace
This is Daryl W. Perry, host of Free Talk Live. This November, I'll be running in the world's biggest and most popular marathon, the New York City Marathon. And I've accepted a spot on Team Innocence Project because I'm a passionate supporter of their work. Since 1989, 353 people in the United States have been exonerated by DNA testing, including 38 who pled guilty to crimes they did not commit, and 20 of whom served time on death row. The Innocence Project provided direct representation or critical assistance in 180 of these cases. With your help, the Innocence Project can help even more people who have been wrongly convicted. As part of Team Innocence Project, I am raising awareness about wrongful convictions and raising funds to help free the innocent. I've already paid the race registration fees. However, to secure my spot on Team Innocence Project in the New York City Marathon, I need to raise $3,500 by November 1st. You can support the Innocence Project and help me secure my race entry by going to run.freetalklive.com.